When you think about your relationship with God or a lack thereof, does doubt ever have a place in it? If so, you are part of a long-standing tradition. And when I say that, I'm not thinking about atheists or people who have walked away from the faith, although that's sometimes where our mind goes. I'm talking about people who are thinking, people who are literally seeing the risen Jesus and still having doubts. They want to know some of the same things you might want to know. Is this real or is all of this just this emotional experience that I'm, that I'm having right now between the music and other people crying and all these things that are happening around me? Is it, is it something that's supernatural or is it just my, my hormones and the receptors in my brain going crazy? Is God real when he doesn't answer my prayers? Or when you look around at other people that claim to follow him, and you see people who say, my God is a God who's forgiven me, my God is a God of grace, but there's no forgiveness and there's no grace in the way that they're living. And you see that and you wonder if, if that is what people who follow this God are like, is that God real or not? And if, and if he is, do I want to follow him? And a lot of times when we do that, and these doubts pop up in our mind, we can feel very, very alone. Because we don't have places that feel safe to express them. We don't want to tell our family or our friends or our pastor that we aren't really sure about this God thing right now. We have questions. We have doubts in our mind and we don't know where to go with them and we feel isolated and we feel alone. And so I want you to know right now, before we get into anything else today, that if you are someone who is listening to this and you have doubts about who God is, if you have doubts about Jesus, then it is safe place here with us to have them and to express them. Because the truth is, I've even had doubts. Even this last week, I've had some doubts in my mind as I was dealing with a broken uh, AC system in our home, where every day the guy would come to fix it and something else would go wrong. We would fix one thing and two more things would show up. And we got to the point where every day I'm praying, God, you know how much uh, we need this for our family. You know what our budget is because you've been a part of it. You know what we've already spent and what we've promised to give to you for other projects and you keep raising the price. And every time it seems like we've hit the cap, you've gone uh, and let something else happen, God. If you know all these things about us and you're hearing my prayers, why aren't you doing anything about it? What's up? And it seems like sometimes it's easy to have doubts and laugh about them when there are things like that, which and in some ways is just an inconvenience. But I've also had doubts on those days when I got a phone call once years ago from family that one of our family members, uh, their new baby, was being rushed to the hospital and was unresponsive. And I remember praying with such confidence that if everyone is is gathered together and praying, and there were literally thousands of people praying, then God would step in and intervene and do something about this, and the child still died. And even though God has done an incredible work through that, I still had doubts. Like, why are you letting that happen? While these other people that probably have earned a little bit more of that aren't having that happen. Why do bad things happen to good people, right? So where do these doubts come from that we have? They come from the fact that we're human. If you've ever been in a uh, place where you've suffered something, if you've ever been in a place where you've been hurt, if you've ever been in a place where you've had to think through things and stuff wasn't quite adding up together, you're a human being, and those human being qualities are where these doubts come from. So they're not from this bad place or this embarrassing place where we have to suffer in silence. They're part of what makes us, us. And so Craig Rochelle actually wrote a list of things that said, this is where most of our doubts about faith 
come from? They come from living as a human being in this world. So they come from questions you can't answer, situations that seem unfair, hurts you can't resolve, and people who follow God but don't look like it with their lives. In other words, these doubts often show up because we're trying to protect ourselves, our reputations, we're trying to protect our ability to have hope, we're trying to protect ourselves and our hearts from being damaged, and we're trying to protect ourselves from not being disappointed again and taken advantage of again and manipulated again. We want to think through things because of this. We want to have some sort of evidence because of this. In fact, Jesus talks about this when he's talking to the disciples that are going to follow me. He tells them basically, look, whoever is going to go to war is going to count the cost before they go. And if you're going to follow me, you're going to need to count the cost too. Oswald Chambers put it this way. Doubt is not always a sign that a man is wrong. It may be a sign that he's thinking. And so doubt really isn't the issue when it comes to our faith. The issue we run into is what are we doing with this doubt? How are we trying to resolve it? How are we trying to cope with it in the context of our life? You see, the enemy looks at these doubts as opportunities. They are opportunities for him to have a way to come in and slyly push us, drive us away from God. God didn't hear your prayer about the air conditioning. He doesn't care about anything you're praying about. Why are you following him? Why do you keep praying to him? This thing you're feeling, it isn't real. What you experienced before, all those changes that happened in your life, those were just you. Those were just uh, chemical reactions in your brain. There's nothing really going on there. So why would you believe in something crazy like a Jesus who rises from the dead? You've done so much wrong. Your life is so full of guilt and shame. How could God ever love you? Yeah, I know he says he does, but does he, do you really believe that? And over and over again, the enemy will take doubts that we have and want to twist them. Want to use those questions to make you feel alone and isolated and driven away from God. To make you feel like he's not with you in the midst of this. But God also sees these doubts as an opportunity. He sees it as an opportunity for him to prove himself to you and for you and I to lean in to God. Your questions can be an incredible catalyst for your faith to grow. Your relationship with God is on a journey, right? And so there's people that if you go through a journey with with people together and you have to overcome something, you are bound closer together than if you were just walking down the road and everything is smooth and everything is great. And so sometimes God is going to use these doubts that you have, these questions that you have, as something that he can help you overcome in order to have your faith be strengthened, have your faith be able to stand up when things don't always go the way you hoped they would go. The most famous doubter in the Bible shows us this. He's somebody, he gets kind of a bad rap. His name is Thomas. And oh, the backstory on Thomas is that up until this point, he seems to be a pretty stand-up guy. He seems to be someone that you could look up to. I mean, we really don't know a lot about him, but the times we do are times where he stepped in to the story in a way that shows that he knows what's going on. The first time we kind of encounter him is, is when Lazarus is dead and Jesus has been called back to go and try and help him. But if he goes back, he's going to walk right into the town and into the area where people are trying to kill him. And so he waits a few days and Lazarus has passed and been buried and he's like, okay, now it's time to go. And the rest of the disciples are, are we, are we sure we want to do this? Are we sure we want to go and walk basically into this trap? Because we know what could happen when we get there. And, and Thomas speaks up and he says, well, let's go with him. We can go with him and we can die with him. 
So he's not someone who's lacking in courage. Another time Jesus is talking about going back to heaven to prepare places for the disciples and for us. And Thomas speaks up again. And basically what he says in my paraphrase is, hey, that sounds incredible. I want to be where you are, but I'm not exactly sure where you're going or how to get there. So can you help me answer my questions so I can figure out what to do? And then we get to this story. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's come and he's appeared to the disciples that were gathered in the room. He's gone on a walk with some friends to Emmaus. He's appeared before the women at the tomb that started all of these things in motion. And we get to the end of that day. In John chapter 20, verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Now we don't know why Thomas wasn't there. Maybe he just needed to step outside for a minute and get some air and take a lap around the the city mount. Maybe he was picking up pizza for everybody because it had been a long day. And he thought he would go get some dinner for everybody. We don't know why he wasn't there, but he wasn't there. And so he suffered from some severe and significant FOMO. Fear of missing out because he had missed out on seeing his risen Savior, the Messiah, back with them alive. And his friends, these other disciples, kept telling him that. When it says that they said, they said that we have seen the Lord, what it really says there is they said that over and over and over again on repeat in front of him. I don't know about you, but if you heard that you missed out on something so incredible and you were having trouble processing it and they just kept telling you over and over and over again about it, you may get a little annoyed. You may be a little frustrated. You may be a little bit even more questioning than you were before. And so this is what he does in response to that. Thomas said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my finger where the nails were, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. This is where the doubt piece comes in, right? What Thomas was probably doing was protecting himself. It had been a traumatic few days. He had seen himself abandon his Lord. He'd been on the run from authorities who wished him at best to throw in jail and at worst to kill him too. And he had his Savior who he loves crucified, dead, and buried. The one he believed was coming to make all things right And that wasn't how making all things right was supposed to happen. And so this thing right now that he's hearing from everybody else is confusing. It's disturbing in a sense. And he doesn't know what to do with it. And so he just has questions. He has doubts. And so he's asking for something that sometimes we give him a hard time about. But he's asking for the same experience that they had. Jesus had come to them. Jesus had been before them. Let uh, let them touch him. Let them see him. Thomas is like, I need that too. If I'm going to get to where you are, I need to have the same experience of Jesus that you had. And so we keep reading. And this next part is simple, but I believe it might be the key to what's going on here. A week later, His disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Did you hear that? Thomas, full of questions. Thomas, the one who had missed out. Thomas, the one who wasn't sure what was going on, stuck around with them for over a week. He didn't run off. He stayed there with his doubts, with his questions, with those people, right in the middle of a bunch of people that had something that he didn't have yet. He stayed there. He stuck it out. 
And I want to encourage you, if you are one of those people right now that has been um, full of questions, full of doubts, if maybe the church has hurt you or wronged you, if something in your life has made you say that this faith thing isn't worth it, and yet you're still sticking it out, you showed up in a church, you've listened to this message, thank you for doing that. Thank you for leaning in to what God is trying to do in your life. Because what happens to Thomas next, I think, I believe, can happen to you too. So a week later, his disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. And he said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. If you want to encounter Jesus, if you want the same experience as the people who had met him before did, then you need to show up where Jesus is going to show up. And he's promised where two or three are gathered in his name, he's going to be there. So Thomas, sticking it out with those other people, is there, and Jesus shows up. And locked doors couldn't keep him out. Barriers weren't in the way of him getting to Thomas. And he gets there, and it sounds like he's been aware of what Thomas has been saying and thinking, because he, he offers up to Thomas exactly what Thomas asked for. Here's my hands, here's the nail holes. Go ahead and feel them. My side, I've got that right here. Go ahead and check that out for yourself. He comes and he shows up with exactly what Thomas needs. He gives them exactly what everyone else had experienced. Jesus was never far off, and now he's ready in this place to not just be seen, but to be touched and to be held. That's how close he is. And all that happens before the switch to stop doubting. It wasn't like Thomas stopped doubting and then Jesus showed up. No, Thomas was still doubting and Jesus was there. And because Jesus shows up in the midst of his doubt, Thomas is able to declare, my Lord and my God. He switches from doubting to declaring. He is the one who gives the climax of this whole gospel of John. For he is the first one who declares who the risen Jesus truly is. My Lord, the one who I surrender to, the one who controls my life and my destiny, and my God. He has the power to overcome the grave. He has the power to set me free from sin and shame and guilt, and he is worthy of being praised. My Lord and my God. Thomas got there by going through his doubt. Thomas got there by leaning in when he had questions, when he had concerns, when he was confused, and letting Jesus meet him in that place. You see, God is big enough for your questions and your doubts. They don't diminish him. He can take them. And he is reaching out for you in the midst of them. How strong was Thomas' faith after this? Well, you can read a little bit about him in Acts, but this is what we know from, from history. At about 72 AD, Thomas had made it all the way to India. So this guy who hadn't moved probably more than 15 to 30 miles at most from his house by the time Jesus had died was now a quarter of the way, a third of the way around the world sharing the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus in cultures that he had never experienced or known about before. And in 72 AD, he had done it in such a way that there were people calling for him to die if he would not denounce Jesus. All he had to do was say, yeah, I made this up, or it's not as important as I said it was at first, just, you know, excuse me and carry on about your, your business, but he wouldn't do that. Instead, he let himself be killed in a very painful way 
because he could not deny the one who had come and met him right at the place of his doubts. Doubt doesn't mean that you're in a bad spot forever. In fact, doubt can be the catalyst that grows your faith exponentially. Because if you're willing to lean into it and lean into Jesus in the midst of your doubts, he will meet you there and give you exactly what you need to move forward with them. You see, doubts are going to come. You're a human being and you live in this world, not some make-believe one. And so you're going to experience hypocrisy. You're going to experience pain and suffering and unfairness. And the, the push is going to be driven away from God. But don't do that. Lean into him. Lean into him by surrounding yourself with other people who are believers. And you know, in scripture it talks about sometimes we borrow the faith of others in these times. Do that. Lean in by continuing to pray and call out to God. Communicate to him what you're feeling. Don't have to hide it from him. He knows. And he can take it. Lean into him by getting into uh, the scriptures and seeing the words he's already shared that his spirit can bring to life in you what he needs to. Stick around. Express your doubts. There's no shame in them. There's no need to hide them. And Jesus will give you what you need. He's not looking for flawless faith, right? Just a little bit of faith, the size of a mustard seed, can move a whole mountain. Would you pray with me? Jesus, today I'm here before you as open and transparently as I can be. There are things about you that I don't understand. I have questions that I can't answer. There's things I've experienced that have hurt me deeply, and I wondered where you were. There were times I've seen things that are unfair, and I've said, why did you let that happen? And I've seen people who call on your name acting in such heinous ways that it makes me wonder if you are really there. Lord, here are my doubts. Today, it is the only offering I have to give you. I'm leaning in. Give me the strength and the courage to stick it out, to be around, to still seek after you, because you are reaching out for me. Come close, Father. Come close, Jesus, that I might be able to see you and feel you, and know your presence, and you could give me exactly what I need to get through my doubts, so that like Thomas, when I meet you at the point of my doubt, my faith will be so strengthened that nothing will be the same after that moment. Thank you for not needing me to be perfect before you show up in my life. And thank you for helping me to mature and to grow and discover more of you each day. May I never feel like I need to drive myself away from you to find answers that only you can give. I pray these things in your name, Father.